This year's Marlboro Triathlon will once again feature a couple of very recognizable faces. Dick and Rick Hoyt have been racing partners for over 30 years now, and I caught up with them earlier this week as they prepare for the upcoming race. Dick talked to me about how their racing careers got started. I gotta blame all this on Rick. Rick was attending a South Middle School out in Westfield, Massachusetts, and his gym teacher got him involved in all the gym activities with all the other children, and he was also the basketball coach at Westfield State College. So he used to take Rick to the basketball games. Well, at one of the basketball games, they made an announcement that one of the cross players from the college was in an accident. He was paralyzed from the waist down. So they're gonna have this cherry road race to try to help raise some money so he could pay his medical bills. Well, Rick communicates with the computer with his head switch. And when he come home from that game, he told me all about it. He said, Dad, I have to do something for him. I wanna let him know that life goes on even though he's paralyzed. I wanna run in the race. Well, at the time I was 40 years old, I was not a runner. I used to run maybe three times a week, a mile each time, just to try to keep my weight down. And that's all we had was a Mulholland wheelchair that was form-fitted, prescription-made to Rick's body, and it was similar to this chair here. So we went down to the race, and it was a five-mile race, and the gun went off, and Rick and I took off with all the other runners. Well, everybody thought Rick and I go to the corner and turn around and come back. Well, we didn't. We finished the whole five miles coming in next to last, but not last. <laughs> That's one thing in all these years, we've never been last in a race. But when we got home that night, uh, Rick wrote on his computer, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears, which was a very powerful message to me. If you think about it, somebody can't talk, use their arms and their legs, and now they're out there running, the disability disappears. He called himself Freebird because now he was free and able to be out there competing and running with everybody else. And he actually had a sign made up that he attached to his running chair that said Freebird, and that's one of his favorite songs. But you know, there was only one problem after that race. I was disabled. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had so many muscles in your body that could ache, and I could hardly walk for two weeks. So I told Rick, if we're gonna continue running, we're gonna have to get a chair built so I wouldn't be hurting as badly. So we went up to Crotchet Mountain in Greenfield, New Hampshire, and we met an engineer up there, and we told him what we wanted for a chair. And he just got some old pipes and tubings, and he welded them together, and then we got an insert for Rick to sit in. And this is what we call a running chair. And that's how it all got started. His fault. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, Dick and Rick have never finished last in a race. In order to accomplish this, the Hoyts have logged hours upon hours of training which became a little more difficult when Rick moved to Boston to attend Boston University. So what I had to do, I had to replace him with a bag of cement, you know, and because at the time he weighed 95 pounds and a bag of cement weighs 94 pounds. But you want to see the looks that I got when I'm running downtown with a bag of cement. And they all said, oh, there goes that loony guy. <laughs> After a few years of racing, the Hoyts decided to start competing in triathlons, which posed a problem for Dick. Well, what happened was when Rick and I decided we wanted to do triathlons, I did not know how to swim. And I hadn't been on a bike since I was six years old. And I was in the process of changing jobs, and it meant we had to buy a new house. So I said, well, if we're going to do triathlons, I don't know how to swim. I'm going to buy a house in the lake. And that's why we bought this house here in Holland, Massachusetts, so I could learn how to swim. And I'll never forget the first day I went down and jumped in the water. Guess what happened? I sank. <laughs> I, I couldn't swim 12 feet. So every day I'd come home from work and I was able to swim a little bit further and a little bit further. And in that winter I joined the YMCA so I could continue swimming. And what we have is we have a, a nine foot Boston whaler boat and I put a vest on, on my chest and I tie a rope to the back of my vest to the front of the boat. And the boat is a nine foot Boston whaler. It's very heavy. It's got a wooden floor in it, but it takes, it takes two people to carry it. But we have to think of safety as a number one factor when we're out there swimming, because most of the time it's in the ocean where you get in the current, the wind, and the waves, and a lot of times it's raining out. And we had a special beanbag chair made up that Rick lays in, and then we put a life preserver around him. Staying motivated all these years is not a problem for Dick. Rick is really the one that motivates me and he inspires me, you know. The easiest thing for somebody like Rick is just to give up and quit. Well, he's not a quitter, he's, he's a fighter. And our message is, yes, you can. There isn't anything you can't do as long as you make your mind and, and it, you're gonna do it. And there's no such word as no. So um, when we first started competing, nobody wanted anything to do with us. They didn't want us in the race or anything else because they'd never seen anybody like this trying to compete in a race. 
but we just kept going on and we didn't take no for an answer. So we were able to, to go out and compete and then after a couple of races, people started coming up to us and talking to us and they could see that Rick had a personality and a sense of humor and he loved to be in the middle of running with everybody else because he's always got his arms up in the air and he always has a big smile on his face. So we just don't take no for an answer. And we've been able to do the Boston Marathon. This year was our 30th year. And then when we got into triathlons, they also told us, especially the Ironman, when we applied to do the Ironman triathlon, they also said no. They said, Dick, you're a good athlete. You can compete, but your disabled son has to sit in the sidelines and watch you. And I said, no, we don't do things that way. Mm -hmm. So we were able to negotiate with them. And Rick is the first disabled person in the world to ever compete and complete the Ironman triathlon. Mm -hmm. And now because of his efforts, they have a physically challenged mm -hmm. division. This Ironman triathlon consists of 2.4 miles of swimming in the ocean, 112 miles of biking in the lava fields where it's always in the 90s. It's very humid. There's no trees out there, so there's no shade out there. There's a lot of hills out there. There's a lot of wind out there. It's the most boring bike ride you ever done in your life. And then after that, it's a full marathon, 26.2 miles of running. And our first Ironman triathlon was back in 1989, and there's nobody that has been able to do it the same way that Rick and I do it. Matter of fact, three years ago was the 30th anniversary for the Ironman triathlon, and up until that point, there'd only been 25 people in the world inducted into the Hall of Fame, where Rick became 26 and I became number 27. As trying as these races are for Dick, they can be just as exhausting for Rick. You know, a lot of people say, well, he's just out there for a free ride. Well, it's not. He's out there in front of me on the bike. You know what I mean? And I'm hiding behind him. <laughs> so he's catching all the bugs and all the wind and all of that, you know. And he has, to, he has to stay hydrated and he has to be able to eat too. And being out there, so you know, there was one triathlon we did. We was out there for 12 hours, you know, without stopping and all that. And he has to make sure he keeps himself hydrated you know, before the event and, and during the event too. And it was, the first IME we did in Hawaii was kind of, it was kind of funny for me, but not for him, because there was a helicopter uh -huh. that was zooming down on us, they were filming us, and at the time I had a water bottle in front of him, giving him some Gatorade, and it went all over him. So he had to sit with Gatorade all over him for the rest of the bike and the run. And so he, he couldn't get it cleaned up until the triathlon was all over. Training for these events can sometimes feel like a full-time job. What I try to do is I tr try to do two events a day when, when, I'm, when I'm training for it. And you know, sometimes it's a swim and a bike or a run and a bike. It's a combination of two a day. And usually I'm, I'm working out for three or four hours a day. And I try to do that for at least five days and sometimes six days a week. And we do compete in the summertime just about every weekend. And then when we're getting up for Ironman triathlons, it's an altogether different story because there's times that I'm out on the bike alone for 10 hours training because that's the type of training you have to get in in order to compete in a triathlon, in the Ironman triathlon. Dick believes out of all the events they have participated in, the most challenging was in 1992 when the Hoyts decided to run and bike across the country. Our goal was to leave Santa Monica Pier in LA and end up at the Mary Longwaft in Boston covering 3,770 miles in 45 straight days without taking a day off. And other people that had done it said that that was impossible. You have to take at least a day or two days off a week. But Rick and I, the only ones that have done it the way we do it, they were doing it by themselves. And Rick and I thought just the opposite. We said we're gonna get stronger as we came across, and we did, and we finished it in exactly 45 days on a Thursday night at the Marriott Line Wharf, that Friday night the Red Sox were playing a nationally televised game, and we, so we ran from the Marriott Line Wharf into Fenway Park through the Green Monster. <laughs> and when we got there, they'd say, they said, we, we'll let you speak for two minutes. And I said, well, what can we say in two minutes? They said, if you say that Fenway Park is accessible to the disabled, we'll let you speak for four minutes. <laughs> so we did our four minute presentation. We stayed and watched the game. The Red Sox did win. We went home and we got up the next morning, went up to Philly, Vermont and did a triathlon. There's no question that even after all these years, the Boston Marathon holds a special place in their heart. Well, you know, we live in Massachusetts and Rick, it, went to Boston University, graduated from Boston University, and it was our first marathon that we ever did. 
and it was unbelievable because you know they didn't want us when we first applied to do it too and what they did is they made us qualify in Rick's age group well at the time Rick was in his 20s I was in my 40s in order for us to compete we had to run under two hours and 50 minutes so that fall we went down to Washington DC to the Marine Marathon which is called the People's Marathon and anybody can run in this marathon and they always draw over 15,000 runners and it was funny because when we went down there, I never know what he's going to do the day before an event, but he went out and bought himself a marine outfit oh. to run in a marathon. <laughs> but we ended up running that marathon in two hours and 45 minutes and 23 seconds. And that qualified both Rick and I for the Boston Marathon. Took our official certificates and we've been official entrants ever since. Matter of fact, 1996, the hundredth running in the Boston Marathon, Rick and I were honored as Centennial Heroes by the BAA and their sponsor, John Hancock. So we've come a long way and we've been able to break down a lot of barriers along the way. And Rick actually says that if it comes down to one race a year, he'd want it to be the Boston Marathon. Dick and Rick hope that all they've accomplished proves that people who are physically challenged can do anything they want. They're real people just like anybody else. You know, they may look a little bit different and stuff like that, but people should look at the insides of a person. Right now, there's 17 chapters in the United States that are doing what Rick and I have been doing for the last 24, 34 years. <laughs> yeah, and matter of fact, we had a big party here, uh, Saturday. And we had people from West Virginia, we had people from Tennessee, we had people from Arizona, we had people from Michigan that came here and ran in a race and there was like 50 kids being pushed in a race the way that Rick and I do it. And we actually, six weeks ago, we got an email from Japan and they want us to go over to Japan and start them over the franchise over there. And we've also heard from Germany and Great Britain. And also, uh, it was last year, China called us up and they were gonna have what they call the Walk of China it was going to last for six weeks and it was to show awareness for people who are physically challenged and they wanted Rick and I to go but you know China's a rich country but this was a non-profit private and they didn't have the funds to do it so it's been postponed so that may be something on our schedule in the future. And although the Marlboro Triathlon is a demanding course this duo isn't one to shy away from a good challenge. We really enjoy the, the Marble Triathlon. It, it's a tough triathlon for us, especially because it's our first one of the year. And especially this year, because I just had carpal tunnel and I'm not even supposed to be biking and stuff. So I haven't been able to train. I, I haven't been able to do any swimming. I haven't been able to do any biking. The only thing I've been able to do is run for it. But the swim course, it, it's kind of awesome. And, and they start, when they start the triathlon, they always Rick and I go out first with the pros. And then when we get out of the water, I have to put Rick onto the bike. And with Rick and me onto the bike, we go 400 pounds. But I have to push him all the way down the causeway. And it's probably, I don't know, a quarter of a mile, half a mile before I can get onto the bike. And that's the most dangerous part for us. But then it is kind of a hilly course. When you get on the bike, you go three or 400 yards and you're going up a hill. And then the last stretch of it, there's another big hill. And usually I'm standing up on my lowest gear and you have to do it three times. And then when you get off the bike, you go out and you start on a, these hills. So it's a very hilly course. So it's very challenging for us, but the crowds are, are on our side. It's, it's just an amazing event for us to be able to be there and go across that finish line with all the p crowds of people waiting for us to finish that. Their story is so compelling that even professional athletes have turned to them for advice and inspiration. Chara, who was the captain of the Boston Bruins, mm -hmm. he called me up because he wanted me to be his personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm just flattered that you call me up, but I don't have time to be your personal trainer. So, so what, he wants to do triathlons. And I don't know if he's doing it or not, but I was told he's a real good biker. But anyway, he had our DVD, and everybody knows Rick's very first words he ever said on his computer was, Go Bruins. So they took this DVD up to Vancouver for the final game of the Stanley Cups, and the whole team sat in a room and watched that DVD, and they said, Go Bruins, and they went out and won the Stanley Cup for the nothing last year. So when they got back home, they invited us to go into Boston, to Spalding Hospital, you know, with the trophy. And then after that, they took us out to the North End and had dinner. And they're really great guys. I mean, they're, they're rough and tough and all that, but they are the neatest guys you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. And even though they've competed in thousands of events, quitting for these guys was never an option. We never thought of giving up. We just get ourselves, you know, 
focused on what we're going to do ahead and we prepare ourselves and nobody wants to be around us for the last two or three days when we're getting ready for an Ironman and stuff like that because we're just focusing and paying attention to our mission that we have ahead and we're going to accomplish our mission. We did have one bad, bad day out in Hawaii because we've got 85 miles into the bike and we crashed on the bike and we spent five hours in the hospital, you know, and the Iron Man ends at, at midnight and I just, we were getting out of the hospital like at two o'clock in, in, the, in the morning and he wanted to go out and finish the race. <laughs> <laughs> Even as Dick closes in on his 72nd birthday, Team Hoyt still has no plans on hanging up their running shoes. You know, Rick and I are still having fun doing it. We're still able to do it. Our times have gotten real slow now, you know. We're really slowing down, but we're out there competing. And people don't care about our times anymore. They just want to see us out there continue doing it. And we're inspiring people from all over the world that are out now doing running. And not just people who are in chairs and physically challenged, but people who are not runners and stuff. We had a young lady that was ready to commit suicide and she saw one of our DVDs and now she's out running and doing triathlons. We've had alcoholics, we've had drug addicts that are now clean because of our story. And last year we got invited over to Switzerland because they had a soccer team over there and they weren't very good and they watched one of our DVDs and they won the championship. So they wanted to send a private plane to pick us up so we could be over there for the award ceremony. But unfortunately we weren't able to do it because of our schedule. And then we got a call from Barcelona, Spain, and once a year they honor the top male and female athlete of Spain, and they're going to give us a special award, and they wanted to come over with a private plane and pick us up and take us over, but unfortunately we weren't able to do that either. But as you can see, from when nobody wanted us, you know, and now we're invited all over the world, and when Rick was born, they said he's going to be nothing but a vegetable for the rest of his life. And he's just got, he's now, and instead of a vegetable, he's a bronze statue. <laughs> that's been unveiled. <laughs>